Good evening and welcome to our Wednesday midweek roof well service. Thank you for tuning in today. We bless and we magnify the name of the Lord. We thank you, Father, for another opportunity, Father, to celebrate your goodness and your mercy and your grace, Father, upon our lives. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. We thank you that you are good and you are kind. We thank you that you are loving, Father. You are compassionate, Father. You think of us, Father, even when we don't think the right things about ourselves. You think of us as your own, Father. And that's why we are able to come before you. We worship and we praise, Father. To lift your name high, Father, everywhere we go, everywhere we are, Father. We thank you for your faithfulness, Father. Thank you for your kindness, Father. We bless your holy name. This evening as we worship the name of the Lord, wherever you may be, if you can rise in your feet, if you can, if not, whatever your posture of worship is this evening, we ask that you worship the name of the Lord. We're going to sing a song, Eze, because our King, our God is King of all kings, is the Lord of all lords, and we'll worship Him this evening. Hallelujah. You can dance wherever you may be, you can sing, you smile, as we worship and praise the great I am. Oh, we worship you. Your name is high and lifted up above every other name we sing. You alone deserve the praise. You are the miracle working God. All power belongs to you. We sing. You alone yeah. deserve the praise. You are the same yesterday and today and forevermore we sing. You alone deserve the 
Father. We praise you, Lord. From everlasting to everlasting, yes, Father. Father. Because you alone are God, Father. You alone deserve the worship, Father. You alone deserve all the praise, Father. Your name is high and lifted up, Father. It's not like you, Father. Father, we give you all the praise, Father. We worship you, God.
God, we just want to thank you for uh, such an awesome opportunity to be able to come into your presence. We want to give you the glory that you deserve, the honor that you deserve. Father God, we realize that without you, that we would have no reason to exist because you are the reason for existence. You defined existence. And we are just in all of you to this, this uh, evening. We are all in all of you because of everything that you have done, everything that you are continuing to do in the life of this ministry, in the life of your people, and, uh, and the life of the global stage, through the government, through um, just the various churches, uh, all the inner workings um, that you have designed and orchestrated to bring about your glory. And Father God, we're just, um, we're just awestruck right now. We are like, uh, like Isaiah uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 when he uh, had an encounter with your glory and, uh, and he was just in awe. And that's where we are right now. We are just in awe because of who you are. And so we just glorify you. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. We know that without you, um, none of this would be possible. And even for our very salvation in itself, when you sent your son to die on the cross of Calvary, and we were able to, uh, that we're able to now have an opportunity to come into your presence unashamed uh, uh, by your grace. And, uh, and now you have given us the, uh, the awesome, awesome, awesome uh, responsibility of being channels of your grace. And so, Father God, we just praise you. We honor you. We pray that tonight's message um, will be something that we can reflect on, take hold of, and continue to glorify you. In the name of Jesus, your son, we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Um, if you have your Bibles with you, um, please turn to Romans uh, chapter, um, turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to um, 17. Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17. Um, you know, we've had a pretty much very awesome, awesome weekend. Um, just reflecting back on last uh, Saturday, um, for the first time on the national stage in this nation, we have celebrated what we call Juneteenth. Um, I was reading somewhere that how Juneteenth, um, which is a commemoration of, uh, of, uh, of the liberation of, of, of blacks who were in bondage um, from uh, in, in bondage and slavery here in America um, since uh, the year 1619, and how in 1865, um, the 13th Amendment was uh, ratified, but leading up to the, the ratification of the 13th Amendment, um, and uh, we had slaves on the 19th of June who were just receiving the message that they were free, and that freedom actually by executive order had gone on for almost two, year, two, two years and maybe five months prior to that time. And so to be able to celebrate that on a national stage is something that is, is awesome, it's symbolic, it's showing that, that this nation is um, going, is stepping forward in the right direction. And, and, to, and even in couple with that, to find out that it was actually the church that led to the, that led the, that were in charge or taking hold of the celebration of Juneteenth. Um, if, you, if you may not recall historically, um, Juneteenth started in the state of Texas. It was legal in the state of Texas, but even prior, even prior for it to be an illegal holiday in the state of Texas, the church, the body of Christ, were the ones who led in that celebration. So, you know, this is just as important um, as any other uh, holiday that we celebrate, like Easter, uh, uh, like the Resurrection Sunday, or like uh, Christmas, where we take the time to honor Christ, um, this Juneteenth is uh, a moment in which we can celebrate that because it's taking out the time to honor Christ. And for us as black people, it is very symbolic because it's connected to 
um, is connected to what we understand in the, what we see in the physical is connected to what took place in the spiritual. Uh, we are being set free from bondage. Um, and also following the celebration of Juneteenth on, Sun, uh, on Saturday, uh, on the very Sunday after that, we celebrated Father's Day, um, in which we just took out the time to just really um, show fathers how much we really, really appreciate them. Uh, I'm a father myself, and the one thing that I realize about Father's Day is just how much of a divine um, responsibility it is to be a father to your children. And so uh, Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, we're just going to kind of pick up where, uh, where, where we left off on, on Sunday uh, with um, the message that Pastor IBK had preached. Um, and this is just a little bit of something to kind of touch on that. And, um, you know, the, the one thing that stood out is that we are channels of, of God's grace. And um, so Romans chapter 8, verses 14 to 17, I am reading out of the Amplified. It says... For all who are allowing themselves to be led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Verse 15 says, For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading again to fear of God's judgment, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, the spirit producing sonship by which we joyfully cry, Abba, Father. Uh, verse 16 says, the Spirit himself testifies and confirms together with our spirit, assuring us that we believers are children of God. In verse 17 it says, and if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, sharing his spiritual blessing and inheritance if indeed we share in his suffering um, so that we may also share in his glory. Uh, one of the privileges of being in the Messiah, being in Christ, apart from uh, being saved from the penalty of sin and death and being given a clean slate and a new life is a change in your identity. Uh, this new nature is one that identifies Yahweh as your father. I was reading somewhere that according to the National Father's Initiative, one in four children live without a biological, a step, or an adoptive father in the home. One in four children live without a biological father, live without a stepfather, or an adoptive father in the home. That means that one in four children have, have almost no relationship with their father. Now, I do want to make clear that this does not indicate or this does not necessarily speak to um, fathers who may be absent from the home physically but are present in the life of the children. However, this does state that in one in four households, that they are, that in one in four households are households without fathers being physically present. Um, or physically living there. So one of the, so one of the um, awesome, awesome, awesome things that comes, uh, one of the privileges that comes with us being uh, born again, us being saved, is that, we, that Yahweh ad identifies himself as our Father. The good news, and this is something that we really should uh, pay a lot of attention to, um, the good news is that when you become born again, Yahweh assumes the role of your father. He is ever present. He is, he is ever loving, and he is always available. I, I, I do not know exactly what you may be dealing with or have dealt with in regards to your upbringing, uh, but the Apostle Paul makes it clear that Yahweh is our father. If, 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 um, if you did not grow up with an emotionally available or physically present father, 
then know that you no longer have to carry that stigma because if you are in Christ, then in a very real and tangible way, God is your father. Fatherhood is central to God's plan for you because God identifies you as one of his own. Matter of fact, Yahweh identifies you in his son. It, it's, it's interesting how um, when you're talking to people, whether they be saved or unsaved, how they readily uh, call themselves children of God. Uh, the scripture, however, indicates that we are being called children of God and it, our, our, ch our, our childhood or our, our, our relationship with God is not just affirmed by what we say verbally, what we, what we believe in our, in our hearts and in our minds, but it's also that the Holy Spirit who dwells within us is the one who also affirms that we are the children of God. So, you know, it's funny because we, we would sit there and we talk to our unsaved friends or our, our saved friends, and if, and if they get cussed out by somebody, one of the things that would have a tendency of saying is that that person uh, who cussed me out caught me everything but a child of God. So it's interesting how we tend to evoke being a child of God in our dialogues, but not everyone is a child of God. Even though everyone has been created by God, not everyone is a child of God. Being a child of God is a privilege. It is a privilege to call God your father. And the Holy Spirit affirms that you are, uh, that you are a child of God. The Holy Spirit is the one who enables you to call God your father and actually, and, and actually live that reality out. That is not available to everyone. Amen? So the last place that I left off is that Yahweh identifies you in his son. Now, now what does it mean to be a son? Because the passage earlier talks about um, that we now have a spirit of adoption, that we are adopted as sons. So what does it mean to be a son? The word son, it comes from the Hebrew word ben, like, like Uncle Ben's minute rice. In the ancient Near East, there was no such thing as having an identity or, um, sorry, having an individual identity. Matter of fact, individualism is a westernized construct. Every person in Middle, in Middle East culture, in Mideast culture, in the ancient Near East, was identified by their father or their, or their clan, which at the head of their clan was their father. So David was identified as the son of Jesse, or uh, to be um, linguistically uh, accurate, he, he, was been, he would have been called David ben Yeshai, son of Jesse in English. In the, in the New Testament, Peter was known as Simon Barjona. This lets us know that Peter is the son of Jonah. Um, uh, or oh, how about it in our everyday context, um, for instance, someone like Osama bin Laden. Um, this lets us know that, that Laden is the father of, of Osama or that Osama comes from, um, for, comes from a, a, a heritage that at the helm of that heritage is Laden, his father or great-grandfather. That name, um, that name Laden is being passed down and so when you now look at the children of Osama bin Laden, or, 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 the, or yeah, the children of Osama bin Laden also assume that name bin Laden. Laden is the father of Osama, or he is the paternal, uh, or, or, or Laden has a paternal uh, relationship in some way, some, in some way, some form, in some way, in some form to Osama. But going back to the scriptures, um, in the case of Jesus, Peter in, in Matthew uh, chapter 16, verse 16, identifies Yeshua as the Mashiach, the Messiah, the Christ, Ben Elohim, or Julios, or Julios Theos, that is, he is the Son of God. In, in those days, um, it was assumed that, that, that his name 
would have, it would have been assumed that his name was Yeshua ben Yosef, uh, 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 Jesus, the son of Joseph. Um, however, it was by, the, by revelation that, um, that those who saw this mere man, who saw this human being, were able to identify him as the son of God. So the word son, it, it, which it comes from the Hebrew, uh, the Hebrew word ben, um, from, the root word, from the root word bana, meaning one who builds or one who continues the father. Let me say that again. The word son comes from the Hebrew word ben, D-E-N, which comes from the root word bana, which means to build. The word son in Hebrew means one who builds or one who continues the father. So to be a son is to take on the responsibility of the fathers of a father's agenda or to carry out a father's affair or, 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 or a father's affairs. In other words, the son maintains the father's reputation and purposes throughout the earth. There's many examples in which the word son was being used or the phrase son of God was being used. Um, in the case of Israel, Israel was called uh, the son of God by Yahweh in Exodus chapter 4 verse 22 in which Israel, in which God, God called Israel his son, called Israel his firstborn. In Genesis chapter, uh, um, in, in Genesis chapter uh, 6, it talks about the sons of God who, um, who were in the heavens, who basically had a meeting. Um, in some theological circles, this was known as the divine council. Um, in, um, in, in, in Psalms chapter 82, it talks about the, it talks about the sons of the Most High. Um, even, in the, even when it comes to kingship, um, 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 14, um, David, uh, the sons of David were identified as the sons of God. Um, um, in Luke chapter, wow, I want to say Luke chapter 1, verse 32. I could be wrong with the quotation. However, in the book of Luke, um, Adam, the first man um, that was created and placed in the garden, um, our human, par our human parent, um, Adam was called the son of God. Well, what does all these um, terms, uh, son of God, imply? Because it's being used across the board, uh, specifically um, in the uh, concerning the church, the phrase son of God is uh, uh, it, it implies that. Who God has called his son is one who would uh, administer his justice and his righteousness throughout the nations. This is the one that God has chosen to um, administer Yahweh, the affairs of Yahweh because Yahweh is now identified as their father. And so therefore, there's the sons of the father are the ones who will carry on the affairs of Yahweh. And there is no one that is better in fulfilling this particular obligation throughout all the scriptures than Jesus Christ, who is called the only begotten son. In other words, he, is in, he has a unique relationship with the father. He is the unique son. The only begotten Son is another word of saying he. Another way of saying that he is the one. In, he is the one, in, one of a kind Son of the Father. There is no one like him. Jesus is the uh, only Son, or the only, the one and only Son of God. He is the unique Son of God. I know that was a, a mouthful, but that's just it's just so interesting to see how. All these play out because Yeshua, as the unique and only begotten Son of God, completely pleases the Father. And because he is the perfect pattern of sonship, the scripture says in, in Romans chapter 8, verse 14, that if we are led by the Spirit, then we too will be identified as sons. Why? Because the, because the Spirit empowers us to live just as Yeshua lived. Mm. 
That means that we, that means that there's almost no excuse for us to not live a life that is holy, that live a life that is righteous because we have the spirit of God, the same spirit that resurrected Yeshua from the dead now dwells in us. And that same spirit causes us to demonstrate to the world that we are children of God, that God is our father. Causes us to demonstrate to the world that we are the channels of God's grace. Romans chapter 8 verse 29 tells us that our ultimate destination is to be conformed to the image of his son. Why? So like Yeshua, who is our elder brother, we can truly radiate the Father's love. God's desire, the God's desire is for us to look, God's desire is for us to look, act, talk, and walk like Jesus. And as a good father, he empowers us to do so by giving us the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit who causes us to live out his son. The Holy Spirit causes us to live out his son. He's such a good father that in, that he, and he knows that in and of ourselves we are, in, we are incapable of living out a righteous life. So he sends his, sends his son who is, who is the one who best lives out the righteous life, lives out the standard that God has called us to live, and then he gives us his spirit so that we can now live like his son. Our attitudes, the way that we think, the way that we conduct ourselves is like that of the Son, who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus said in, in John chapter 14, verse 9, that if you have seen him, you have seen the Father, which means that if you 